All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a cold afternoon, windy too. I'm Rebecca Graves, and I'm the education librarian down at the Health Sciences Library. And I'm Janice Dicer, and I'm a science librarian here in the Maine Library. And today we're going to be talking to you how to maximize your impact by having a distinct identifier. So there's no or very little name ambiguity. And then also some tools that'll help make you and your work discoverable. Um, everybody should have a handout. It's either blue or yellow. I think everybody got the blue. Um, if you need a yellow one, you can grab it. They're all the same. Um, these are the links that we're going to be looking at today. Um, there's also on the back is contact information for myself and for Janice. Um, and also a guide for what we're talking about today so you don't have to um, write everything down. So if you've already logged into your computer, um, either the one here <laughs> in the lab or your own laptop, if you go to the library's website, so I'm at library.mu, I mean, sorry, library.missouri.edu. I'm used to saying another one. Um, you can either type in this URL or an easy way to get here from the library's page is to simply go to the upper right where it says search library website and type in research identity. I think researcher ID also works. Yeah, so I think there's more than one term you can type in and then you'll see guide for maximizing your research identity and impact and go ahead and click on that and that's this guide for this class um, if you're using your own computer you can bookmark it if you want um, and so we're going to be working off of that today and so i'm going to kick it off and so starting with the problem of ambiguity about names um, it's you want people to know that your work is your work or to, or instead of when they search on you, instead of another problem could be they don't even find your work because of other names. Because we all know there's a lot of people with similar or the same names. Um, people change names for a variety of reasons, one marriage being a big one. Um, there's also different cultural conventions on names, like where the um, family name comes and the personal name comes, which order um, changes by culture. And then even if you don't change your name, but you change your institution, that can throw people off too. Um, I know one of our researchers was listed at being at Baylor and she had never gone there. She'd never worked there or studied there. She had just co-authored with a lot of people there. So we, to reduce all that, um, some folks got together to work out a solution. And the solution we're gonna be talking about today is the ORC ID. And has anybody heard of that? Okay, so several and several people are shaking their heads yes, some are shaking their heads no. Um, welcome. There's some handouts on the side. <laughs> yeah, so you can sit over there and you can also, there's a handout. Does um, anyone already have an or ORCID ID? Okay, great. So we have at least four people with, or five. Okay, so we've got several people with an ORC ID. Um, so ORC is the Let's see, I wanted to pull up my cheat sheets. It's a nonprofit and it's supported by several different groups or quite a few different groups by both educational groups and foundations, also publishers. Um, for example, if you look at Springer Nature, there's a trial going on right now um, where different journals and sites are requiring people to, to public um, researchers to actually have an ORC ID number when they're submitting their work. Um, I don't know if anybody follows the Scholarly Kitchen, but they have some articles about um, ORC IDs. And I'm going to pull, whoops, I'm going to move that out of the way. Um, and sometimes if you're looking at a journal, so here's um, PLOS One or PLOS One. If I look at this article, kind of cool to look at the oldest dinosaur record. If I look at at the author's information, you can see this person has an ORC ID. And what that lets you do is if you click on that, it'll take you to their record and you can see where they've gone, gotten their education, and you can also see the works that they have listed. And then you could, and they also will list other profiles. <coughs> 
So I'm going to click back. So I clicked back on the previous tab, back to the guide. So you can see on ORC ID, we give you a definition about it and how you can register to get one. So if any, if everybody else wants to register, I, for those five of you or so who already have one, bear with us. Um, if you want, you can go ahead and click on that now to register for an ORC ID number. It's free and it's persistent. Um, you can only register for one for yourself. <laughs> and so you can fill this in. Come on in, there's a couple of seats over there. Um, and then there's some handouts. And while you're logging in, I'm just pulling this up. They have the ORC statistics. So there's over almost 4 million IDs have been assigned um, with, and then they break it down with education affiliations and employment, funding, peer review identifiers, et cetera. Um, you can search for people with ORC ID. So if you don't know their ID, if you want to find out, you can find them. So there's a researcher here at MU, Sergey Popekin. So if I search in on the ORC site, it shows me his name. I can click on his number. And again, you can see his education. He's listed his other ID numbers. Some of these we'll talk about today. And you can see funding that he's had. Um, also his works, he has 159 listed. So it's a way to make yourself distinct. It's a way to find people. If any of you work in a lab or um, mentor people, it's a way if you have your, per if you have your mentee's ORC ID number or your lab workers ID numbers when they graduate or if they get jobs elsewhere, that's a way to track what they're doing because you can say, hey, I meant to come on in. There's, I think there might be a seat over there. Um, <laughs> it's a way of tracking their progress because after all, you helped get them started. And that's an indicator of how you have impacted the field. As you can say, I mentored these people and this is the work that they're doing. And it's easy to, you know, to follow them that way, as opposed to trying to follow people by name in case they, you know, did they change their name? Did they change institutions? Um, yeah. Like all those publications. They pull it from various locations. They pull from PubMed. Do you know the other? Uh, well, you can put in your own information if you want to. Um, a lot of people, I mean, if you're just starting out and you have like, you know, just one or something, that's fine. A lot of people will um, go to one of two databases, Scopus, which is what we're going to go into in just a minute or web of science and they can upload, if they have lists, you know, articles listed in there, they can upload them into working. And once you, um, once you set up your account, you have the option to have it automatically updated. And if you click on that link, what happens is it interacts with an organization called CrossRef which is, was established by publishers, and it's an organization that tries to make linking to articles and linking between articles seamless. And so essentially they, Crossref basically tracks almost all the articles that are published now. And they will enter it into your ORCID account for you. And I think you can click off um, a little button that says, please email me every time my ORCID account is updated. And that way you can double check. And of course, if you have an ORCID ID and the publishers start using ORCID IDs, then that's going to be really easy. Yeah. So you shouldn't have to do much work once you have it set up, though it's certainly, I'd check it once in a while. And you could have other things that you want to add 
to it because it doesn't just have to be articles, you know, it can be books and conference presentations, just all sorts of things. And the, and the funding. Yeah, the funding. Yeah. Uh, and have on there. I think probably at this time, I know yeah. like Scopus and Web of Science are entering funding information now for their articles, but I don't think ORCID is pulling that out, so I could be wrong. I'm yeah, as far as I know, it's you have to enter it yourself. Um, any other questions on ORC ID? Okay. So that actually takes us on to I'll move on to um, so we can close these. Okay. I'll, ORCID is an account or a profile that you set up yourself. You have to initiate it. It doesn't just happen. I thought I'd talk a little bit about the author profile in Scopus because that is one that's automatically generated for you. You don't have to do anything except um, this thing kind of gets I know. in your way. We well, I'll side. just type. I'm just going back to the library. Nope. Let me just go here. Oops. Sorry. I clicked on the wrong thing. I meant to go back to the library homepage. Okay. I'm just going to databases and I'm going to go to the Scopus database. Has anybody used Scopus? Are people familiar? Some of you are. Um, for those of you who aren't, Scopus is one of the uh, most heavily used databases on this campus. It um, indexes about 23,000 journals in the sciences and social sciences and some humanities. They're, they haven't done a lot of humanities stuff yet, but they're working on it. And it also has patents in it and conference proceedings and all sorts of things. But today we're just going to look at the author profile. So I'm going to do an author search and I'll get rid of this little announcement from Scopus. And I'm just going to look up a biology professor on campus here. So I'll type in his name. And you can type in your own name if you wish. <laughs> if, you, done if you have, if you have some publications. Um, and here I found his name. He actually has a first initial, but we found it with his middle name and his last name. You can see the variations that he's published under. They're listed here. And if you go to the, click on his name, you'll get his profile that's, that Scopus has created for him. And you can see again, here are all the name variations over here on the right of the little gray, gray box. But this gives a lot of summary information and notice he does have an ORCID ID, it's right here. And if I clicked on this, it's going to take me to his, his ORCID profile. And he's also got a, what Scopus calls an author ID. This is a number used by Scopus. It really has no meaning outside of Scopus. Um, it is, let me move this a little bit. Um, it is part of the URL to his um, author profile. And you can send this URL out to other people and they can look at this information. But if they are, they're at an institution that does not subscribe to Scopus, which there are certainly some, they will just see the top portion of this profile. They won't be able to scan down and see all the different articles that that the person has written. They'll just get the top um, information. Yes. So I have a Scopus profile, but my affiliation needs to be updated. Okay, if you see, which is the next thing I was getting to, so that's a good question. You need, this is automatically generated, however, Scopus does make mistakes. Um, they don't make as many as they used to. They've gotten much better at it. They still make mistakes. So if you um, if you see mistakes, and you should, you know, once or twice a year, just look at your Scopus profile if you've got one and see what it looks like. If you find mistakes, you come over here to the right, and you can request author detail corrections. 
and there's a step by it takes you step by step through making corrections to your account at which you submit at the end and then scopus makes the updates and they'll send you an email saying they've made the updates so you do that pretty quickly now occasionally now i don't know about affiliation if that's on the step-by-step -step thing or not they've been working on it um if it's not you can go to their contact customer service contact number and you can send them an email and explain what's wrong with your profile and they'll communicate with you about that so they're they're very good about making corrections because i've dealt with them a lot on helping faculty make corrections to their accounts and they're very they're very responsive and it's gotten a lot faster when they first started doing this probably five or so years ago it took it would take them probably three weeks or so to get the updates in there. And now it's a matter of a day or two. They're much faster. So that's nice. Now, one thing you'll notice on this little summary thing is something called the H index. And Dr. Perez has an H index of 44. Does anybody know what that's telling you? anybody heard of the H index? Somebody online? Okay. Um, there, a few years ago, um, a physics professor over in Spain decided he wanted to come up with a numerical metric that indicated both the, um, what do I want to say, the quantity or how productive they were, as well as their impact, a person's impact. They wanted one number that reflected both of those things. So his name was Jorge, or his name still is, he's alive, Jorge Hirsch. And so he decided to name, he came up with this metric and he sort of named it after himself. So that's what, that's what the age is in there for, is for his name. But what this is telling you, I'm gonna click on this little eye because they have a nice little little graph up here. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. It's a little graph here. On the left is the number of times the article, his articles have been cited and uh, the lower bar or is um, how many articles he's written. And the H index is the intersection between the number of times an article's been cited and how many articles he's written. So since he has an H index of 45, that is telling you that he has written 45 articles that have been cited 45 or more times. As you can see, he's written more articles. He's written over 100 articles. But only so far, only 45 of them have been cited 45 or more times. Um, and whether that, it's hard to know exactly, you say H index of 45, is that good or not? Well, it's probably anything that high is good, but you really, it's really relative to the other researchers in his field. And they have to be researchers. You would wanna compare that with other, other researchers in a similar field, he's in plant science. So you would look at other researchers in his field of plant science, that have been in the field about as long as he has. And if you go back to the author profile, you can um, see, it kind of say somewhere, here we go, under author history down here in the box on the right, his public, he started publishing in the late 1990s. Scopus now goes back to about 1970, which is nice. Um, so you would wanna look at other people that started publishing in the 2000s to compare. Because if you're starting out as a researcher, if you've only written three articles, your H index, the maximum it can be is three. It can't be any higher. They, they may have been cited hundreds or thousands of times, but your H index is still only three. So it only, you can only compare yourself to your peers as far as time in the, in the area and the area of research. So it's just one metric, but it's, it's starting to catch on. Um, you'll see it in Scopus, you'll see it in Web of Science, um, and a little bit we'll look at 
Google Scholar and you're going to see it in there too. And so something to be aware of because you're starting to see it everywhere. Possibly. It just depends on who's doing the evaluation. <laughs> Now you have to be sure that it, they're comparing you to peers. I mean, hopefully, um, if they're using that as a comparison, they would ask you who are peers in your field because you would probably know right. some and also, names. And as Janice mentioned, it matters on your field too because Dr. Perez is in plant biology, so it's a very large field. If you were in something like ethnopaleobotany, much smaller field. So how many people are there to cite the references or like in the field of nursing, there, it, you know, the, there's not as much publication, so the numbers are going to be different. So it is field specific, and then as Janice also mentioned, time and profession specific. So it has to be your field and your peer group. You can't just say, oh, well, you got to go hit 44. Well, that's meaningless by itself. Now, as far as impact goes, another um, area that's kind of are more metrics that are sort of have arisen in the past few years are an area called alt metrics. Have people heard of that alt, that term, alt metrics? Um, alt metrics is it's sort of the social. It's measuring. It's measuring things like how often the article is used, how often it's downloaded, how often it's been tweeted, things like that. It's kind of the social activity around whatever your research is. Um, the traditional way of measuring impact, of course, is to count the number of times the article's been cited. And that's still the, the main way people are measuring impact. But of course, if you've published an article, it takes a while for other people to read it write their articles and then cite your article and so you you don't gain citations very quickly right away normally with alt metrics stuff you can start seeing action on your article right after it's published and whether or not this is important and useful remains to be seen it's just kind of a new area but scopus does have um, some of the alt metric data in it now and I'll show you an example. We're going to go down to one of his articles. Let's do this one, the butterfly plant arms race. And I'm gonna click on that article to see the full display. And over here on the right, you see a box that says metrics. And of course, the first one is how often it's been cited. And you'll now see in the Scopus, you'll see for a lot of articles, if they have any social activity that is measured by this one company called Plum X Metrics, and it's just one company that measures all metrics that, and it happens to be the one Scopus uses. Um, you'll see this little colorful graph here, or little image. And if you click on this, You'll see a little summary of what's been going on with this article. It's got the citations. If you go down a little further, you'll see that in a database called EBSCO, the abstract of this article has been written or viewed 30 times. People have linked out from that abstract three times. Um, Mendeley is one of the um, citation managers like EndNote and Zotero. And there's, they're monitoring Mende, Mendeley and 257 people have downloaded this article in the Mendeley. It's been mentioned on a couple logs and in a, couple, in a few news items. And down here you can see it's been tweeted and all sorts of stuff like this. And um, So right now, it may, this information may be of most interest to you once you write something um, to see what's happening out in the world. Um, you'll only see this data for articles that have data. You won't see that little colorful image if the article hasn't had any um, action that is recorded by this one company, Plum, Plum Analytics. And of course, older articles probably won't have any information because this is something that's really just started to take off in the last five years tops. Yes. 
so the social media stuff doesn't impact the H index, is that correct? Correct. Separate. They're separate. They're separate. Yeah. Now, publishers, some publishers are starting to get on board with this and they're starting to add metric da data themselves, which may actually be of more interest. And there's one we looked at earlier, uh, the publisher journal plus one. I'm going to go here. Now well, we can't just do the dinosaur again. <laughs> I didn't check if they had a, well, well they do have their they have, they have their own metrics. They put them over here on the right. We can see a thousand people have viewed this article. And for more detail, there's a tab. And that's what a lot of the journals are now doing. They're adding a tab that says metrics on the website. And you can go look at this tab. And in this case, you can see this article's been, they, 929 people have viewed it in HTML and 146 have viewed it in PDF for over a thousand views. And there's another little statistic there. So this could be, it's not, a, it's probably not as good an impact as um, cited stuff, but let's look at another one. There's one, this was in the news. I heard about this in the news the other day, this insects, oh, yeah. how the insects are really decreasing. And if you click on this one, I mean, look at this one. It has had three, oh, you know, over 300,000 views and over 16,000 PDFs. So, if I was this person down the road, you know, if you're going up for promotion or tenure, you might want to highlight this article and say, oh, but besides being cited a lot, by the way, it was, it's been viewed, you know, this many times and it's been downloaded this many times, you know, just as additional information. So you can sort of use this information right now, maybe to enhance at times. Um, it's not, the information's too new, the area is too new for it to really be, you know, like cited references. So it, it remains to be seen how much this altmetric social measuring of the impact is going to, I hate to use the word impact, but impact promotion, tenure, what people think of the, you know, the reputation of the article. Yes. I'm just, my, one of my goals is to help our junior faculty get recognized mm -hmm. for people to see their work. So um, we're looking at um, how social media can be used to help with that. Um, so would you say that, you know, getting the tweets out there and the Facebook posts and things like that, even if um, those don't directly count to, to the H index, probably more people would see them and possibly actually go to that article? And I would say yes. Create, it seemed like it would help. Yeah, I would say yes. The former, I guess he's former now, former director of the Life Sciences Center, Jack Schultz, he was a big promoter of altmetric data. He really believed in it. And, and they tweet a lot about the articles in the Life Sciences Center. And he thought that really brought attention to the articles. Of course, it depends on who you tweet to. I mean, yeah. there is. There is, a, that's actually a great point because um, Teresa Snow, she was a, the director of strategic communication for the MU Healthcare and School of Medicine. And she was talking about how they, and I checked her in Outlook, so she's still here on campus because I know they got rid of a lot of communication mm -hmm. folks. But one of the points she had when she gave a talk a while back is that if you know, if you are going to be, if you have a paper that's in the works, or if you're working with a department and somebody's got a paper in the works, that's the time to prepare the information to go out on social media. Because when that paper, when the journal comes out, like that article about 75% of the insects are gone in Germany, um, that's huge. Um, and so you want to have all the talking points ready. So you want to know like, okay, this article, it's going to come out around here. So I'm going to have my Twitter posts ready. I'm going to have my Facebook posts ready. I'm going to have, you know, a blog post, or maybe even want to do a short little interview. Like, 
30 minute snippet, not 30 minutes, 30 <laughs> second snippet, you know, just to have that already in the queue. And so the day that it comes out, you can just push it out. And as Janice said, you can have like, well, which Twitter feed should it go to? Should it go to the press? Should it go, you know, in which press? Should it go to the local press? Should it go to national? Um, is, are there Twitter feeds? Is there are some, um, I don't want to say departments, but some fields that are really heavy into Twitter and some that are not. So just know your market um, or know your field, whichever word you prefer, market or field, and have the information ready to push out on those fields because, you know, basically you're trying to maximize the impact of your research and your research is important and you want it to reach people. So figure out which, which areas you want it to go to and have that piece ready. I know it's another piece to put on to an already busy day, um, but maybe if you're collaborating on articles already with co-authors, you can say, hey, I'm going to write up the Twitter piece and I'll send that to you and you can do this piece and then we'll have it all ready in a package in a folder and have it ready to go out. Or maybe you have somebody in your department that can work on that piece with and for you. Or there might be a department on campus that can do it for you. All right, we're ready for Google Scholar. All right. Yes. So I just um, tried to for the equal this way this uh, and there are two two lines on the thing. And this is the same person. So you say that Scopus is doing his job on on its own. Right? So well, I, well, no, that's a case. Uh, it's not you, is it? Is it two listings for you? No, no, it's not okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm so saying you go back to school. this is a big guy, right? So, so he just discovered gravitational waves, and so there are still two lines under his name. They are very. So is it is there a way to combine it? There is a way to combine it if he would do it. You know, if he gets on there, or um, or somebody from his institution does it. I've done it for faculty members. I've gone through, because all he has to do is go through this um, little right here request on the right. author details and they merge accounts. Okay. They only, they have some criteria that everything has to match up just so in order for them to put everything in one. And if they have any question about it being a different person and it's all done, you know, by computers, so. And, and that's actually a good point, because if you look at Dr. Peretz, he also has two, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is him, because it says University of Missouri, Columbia, I mean, all that matches, and you have these 18 hanging out here. So you can select them, and you can say request to merge authors. I mean, for that person. Yeah, and probably the reason why these were di different is you can see the location, affiliation is one is the system level, and one is the local campus. And Scopus being Scopus doesn't know, oh, I could, we can just put those together. They see that as two different affiliations. So they're reluctant to do that, but he can go in and actually, since I'm at the University of Missouri, I could go in there and do it for him. And we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions on Scopus? Sure. <laughs> um, so going back to the you know, pushing out the, the tweets and things like that to generate interest, Again, it's them just going and looking at the article isn't impacting the AP necessarily if they actually cite them. Correct. Yeah, it has to, yeah, so to, to change the H index, somebody has to write an article and cite that article, and then it has to get picked up in an index that actually looks at citing, so like That's Scopus or Google Scholar. Um, right. So to increase your H index, you have to write more and more articles and they have to be cited. And one of those is out of your control. I mean, you can write more articles, but citing, that, but I have to admit these H indexes that are computed on like Scopus and stuff, they're not throwing out the self citations. But of course, somebody could look at it more closely and say, oh, this person cited themselves a hundred times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would tip them off, so. So, and there are ways to take out self citations in Scopus and Web of Science, but I don't think they do that for computing H index. So I'd have to look at their. Yeah, I'm not sure. Point. I know that they do have a where you can say take out the self citation. And you had a question? Yeah, uh, there are journals and journals, right? So if you publish a paper in, so how small should be a journal? So it's still counted in H index. 
Right. Should it be a theory of the force, right? Or maybe right. not, yes. Well, in H index, um, it's, well, it has to be, if you're getting your H index computed by Web of Science or Scopus, they have criteria for the journals that they index. And so the journals have to reach, a, you is know, meet available? certain. Is it publicly available? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, it would have to be publicly available. I mean, Google Scholar also does um, H index, as Rebecca will show you in just a minute. And they're a little, you know, they don't have, you know, they're not evaluating journals before they count them. They're just counting them. Yeah, you can look up in Scopus or Web of Science, you can look up which, if a journal is indexed there or what journals they do index. So you can check that when you're looking. That's one way to look for ideas of where to publish. Um, yeah. So I clicked back on the tab for the researcher profile for the guide for this workshop, because I'm going on and I'm gonna talk about the Google Scholar profile, which we have a tab for here on the guide. And how many of you have heard of the Google Scholar profiles? Okay, so quite a few of you, and how many of you have profiles on Google Scholar? Okay, so several of you also have that. Um, and so I'm assuming those of you who didn't raise your hands don't have them. So the benefit of Google Scholar profile is that you don't have to be affiliated with an institution that had, that um, subscribes to or pays for Scopus because um, in order to see the information, you have more control over this. So if you go to Google Scholar, if I, I click on Google Scholar and it has Google Scholar citation and it talks away that it's a way for authors to keep track of the citations to their articles. So you can look at who's um, publishing or who's citing you. But if I go to scholar.google.com, if you want to create one of these, you can go to, just go there as I did, to scholar.google.com and click on my profile. And it'll ask you to sign in. You need to have, you can enter a email and there's more options. Like you can create an account. Um, <coughs> and once you've signed in, you can say that you want a Scholar account. Um, I'm actually going to close out of this if I can move. Whoa. Didn't want to do that. Like, how do I move this without? Yeah. All right. So I just back out of here. All right. So, what a Scott profile looks like, and since we're using Chris instead of Sergey, is that his name? Yeah. So if I search on a person's name, their profile should come up and you should see the feather quill or the quill pen icon and you can see the name. And so in with the Google Scholar profile, you can actually put in a photo or a picture photo. I'm like, is that old language or no? I guess it's not. <laughs> um, you can give your division, you can have a link to your home page, um, you can follow people on here. And on your profile on the right hand side, it'll show your H index as calculated by Google Scholar, which is going to be slightly different than Scopus because they look at different pools of data. Google Scholar does not publish everything they look at. Um, whereas you could get a list of all the journals included in Scopus, you cannot, as far as we are aware of, get that for um, Google Scholar. We know they follow quite a few journals, but we don't have the exact numbers and names. But you see that they have the H, how many citations he's had, um, or he's cited how many, what his H index is 53 on here. Um, Google Scholar will pick up if there's book chapters, might pick up some conference papers. Um, so you get different information on here. They also do the last five years, so they have a rolling column here on the right. And they also have the I-10 index, where you can look at, um, the let's see, in the last five years, so the number of publications it, that had at least 10 citations. So, 
it gives you a slightly different metric. So you have, there's many, many different metrics. So one of the things you have to pay attention to is what your department and what your institution is looking at. What's important in your field? So which one do you need to follow? Um, you can also track co-authors here. Um, and I'm trying to think, those are the big points and they're just, I do want to point out that they, we found out that there are some people whose profiles are not showing or not coming up when they search on it. Um, you do have to, when you go in and create it, you do have to check it to make it public. And you do have to put in a university or an institutional email that can be verified and verified by going into your email. But even so, there's been a couple of folks whose profiles haven't come up and we're waiting to hear back from Google. We finally tracked down a contact. Um, so not everything's, you know, everything's got its drawbacks, but this is another way to have a profile out there that you can manage. So if you end up going to an institution that doesn't have Scopus, where you can't get in to like merge the author names or request them to change things, um, or if you want to have a profile that people who don't have access to Scopus can actually see more data, like the journal titles, this is a good place to go. And it does, it automatically updates your profile once you created it. So that means you definitely want to monitor it because Google can certainly make mistakes, just like Scopus can make mistakes. And, and so you'll want to monitor that. And, and you can monitor it actually easily by, if you click on this follow link, you can say, I want, you know, check off new articles, new citation or new articles by this author and just put in your email if you're the author and then you'll get emails every time your, your Google Scholar profile is updated with more articles. So that's an easy way to, so you don't have to remember to keep going back and checking it. You'll just see, see what they're doing to your, your list. It will be because Google uh, Scopus yeah. covers twenty about twenty three thousand journals. Google covers. They won't tell you what they cover, but they basically, you know, they're looking at everything. So they're pulling in. You know, probably a lot more proceedings, a lot more publications that may not meet the standards that Scopus or Web of Science have for entering into their database. So you'll always get larger numbers on Google Scholar, which is why a lot of faculty like to use the Google Scholar numbers because they're higher, but the ones that are um, in Web of Science and Scopus may have a little more impact because they're, you know, they're from quality journals. Google Scholar, you can't always be sure. Yes. Do you happen to know if once you create your profile and if there's anything to fix, if you fix that, does, does any of that potentially get overwritten? Does it, when it goes and searches for stuff for you, is it only new stuff? Or? It, I thought I saw a hand go up, did you? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I want to be here to Yes, it can get overwritten because I know one of my my colleague Diane Johnson has changed hers and then things have come back on it. You know, like she's cleaned it up. So it's a kind of a toss up between okay, you have this public platform, your Google Scholar profile, but it's, it's not perfect because you can clean it. You still have to keep maintaining it. And they'll say, hey, we saw this article of yours. And you're like, yeah, I told you it's not mine. Um, and so you, you do have to keep monitoring it. So that's kind of the, I, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, you know, the Achilles heel of all these is you can have different profiles to make yourself more discoverable or, you know, promote your work, but then you still have to but then you have to maintain them. I mean, some of them like the Scopus, it's, it's created through Elsevier, through Scopus. So what you're doing is just sending them messages to clean it up. So, but still there's some maintenance there, whereas the Google Scholar, it's more 
you're doing more heavy lifting. Orchid is probably the one that's most requires the least amount of maintenance because they're getting their information when they're updating it from Crossref, which is pretty official. And of course, if more and more people start using or Orchid IDs, that's going to make it. I mean, it may not matter to Google Scholar so much, but for Scopus and and the Orchid profile, it'll it'll really make things easier. So you're sort of getting on the ground level of this stuff, and we'll tweak it as we go along. So I think you're up next with research. Oh, um, I'll just say real quickly. There's something called researcher ID. And that is Web of Sciences author profiles. And personally, I don't recommend doing this one. With, with Web of Science, you have to create your own profile. There's no author profile in Web of Science unless you create it yourself. And you can recreate it, and you can upload stuff from Web of Science. But then you're sort of responsible for maintaining it. And to be honest, from what I've seen, people are not maintaining theirs. And, um, and in some cases we found, I think last year, we actually found somebody who was claiming the, all these articles that they hadn't written. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding, I think, is that Web of Science is working on their author stuff. So I'm hoping they get a better system. So until they get a better system, I would say just ignore researcher ID. If you see that somewhere, just ignore that one for now, because it's not worth your, your time. And then there's two other um, sort of social networking things that you've probably heard of and you're familiar with is academia.edu and ResearchGate. And these are ones, you know, it's totally up to you if you want to join, if you want to have a profile, you know, for some fields it's very good for interacting with other researchers. For others, maybe not so much. Um, both organizations are both, they're not organizations, but both, both sites have tended to encourage you to lo upload your articles, and sometimes people don't really have the copyright permission to do so, even though you may have written the article, that doesn't mean you can post it anywhere that you want. It depends on the contract you sign with the publisher. And the publishers are starting to get real upset about this, and they're starting to take legal action against the sites. They're not taking legal action against individual people, but, but I know ResearchGate is having to do a lot of takedowns of articles, and Academia. So it's up to you whether you, you find those sites useful and you want to use those and have a, you know, maintain some kind of little profile on those. Yeah. Okay. All right. So another piece to this whole puzzle is where you store your information. Um, so I'm going to go up to the top tabs where it says research repositories. And in, so this is in addition to your information and your list of publications is you might want to actually list the data that you have. And if you have the copyright of your articles, you can store this information. And just do you all have, who's heard of MoSpace? Is anybody? Okay. So a couple of people have heard of MoSpace. This is the campus repository for digital storage. And you're welcome to, encouraged to store documents here. That The final document, it's, it's not a working uh, repository, say like Box would be. Um, but this is if you've published a poster or you've written a paper that you still have copyright to, or if you have a data set that you want to put out there, um, either because you're required to, by the, the institution you published with or by your funding, um, or you want it to be out there so you can share it with fellow um, researchers, you can use MoSpace. You, I pulled it up on the screen. You can see that you can browse by different areas such as authors, um, titles, subject. You can also search within it. Um, I'm putting in Hunger Atlas. And if it's one thing you need to keep be aware of is when you pull it up, you see there's a 2008, 2010, but if you scroll down, you'll see the more current one is actually further down in the list. When I look at the record, you see there's an open view, so there's a link to the data. There is a permanent URL. 
So you can use that to link out to it. So if you have information, you could put these. If you have a website, if you have a CV, um, you can use this. Or even if you're just sharing it, you can email it, tweet it to somebody. So the information is discoverable because Google and other search engines crawl this database. It's open for that. Now you can, when you put information in here, you can actually set it that it's, um, oh, embargoed is not the right word, but I guess embargoed. You can actually put a time limit on it to say, don't crawl this right now, don't make this public, keep this private for the next six months, for the next year, because there might be some reason you need to do that. Um, maybe you had interviews with people and that information can't be made public for the next so many months or a few years and you want it to be in here. Um, you do have that option. Um, you can also put in copyright options like the Creative Commons copyright information in here as well. The way to submit in here, you can just up here at the top in the blue band where it says Submit Works, you click on that and it gives you information about who can submit so this is for those of you who are current faculty staff and students and you just submit online or via email so you've got a couple of options here and as i'm and it'll tell you what types of documents can be put in here so pdfs preferred but there are some other file formats that can go in um, and then they also have a license form so how you want to license it and there's contact, so if you have any questions on that. Um, and you might say, well, what about if I'm not going to be staying at MU? What if I'm going to become an independent contractor? What if I'm going to work somewhere else? Maybe I don't know. There are other repositories. Figshare is one. So if I click on Figshare, it's a similar idea. So you can search in here. Um, they do have a freemium, so there's a free you can use it for free, but if you want to upgrade how much storage space you have, um, you can pay for that. I like to pull up world beer consumption and scientific productivity. Do those two go together? Um, here on the right, you see this is another alt. Um, we, Jan has showed you plum metrics. This is one called Altmetrics, another company. So it's a similar idea where you can see that this was blog, it was tweeted, it was on Facebook. Um, and again, you, you have a, you'll have a link in here and comments. So, <coughs> and Figshare, like most space, is crawled by Google and other search engines. So your work is discoverable and you'll have a static link to the information. Um, and how you upload here is there's a link at the top where it says upload. And you do have to create an account. So you'd have to sign in, sign up, and then once you log in, you can log, um, upload your information. So that's another way of making, maximizing your impact is putting your work out there and not just having it on a campus drive um, or just sitting in box, is to put it out in repositories where it can be found. Um, and speaking of that, I might add that most space um, will give you use of statistics too. It will tell oh, you yeah. how many people have viewed it and in general where yeah. they're located around the world. Yeah, so that's one thing. I, and you can see it in Figshare. I'm not going to back all the way out to get to most space, but just like Figshare, it'll show you how many times it's been viewed, has it been downloaded, and as Janice mentions, where in the world people are pulling it from. Um, I want to point out another product or tool. Has anybody heard of Sherpa Romeo or Romeo Sherpa? Okay. So this is, they have Sherpa Romeo, they have Sherpa Juliet, and we do have the link on the web page. And what this is, is that, because I mentioned if you have copyright, if you have copyright, and part of that is you'll have to sign a form. Um, but you can get a heads up on what's coming if you go to Sherpa Romeo, because if you're looking at, this will show publisher copyright policies and self-archiving, like um, how much will you have to negotiate with the journal to do this? Um, I like to search on gut because it's a short title. So if I put that in there, you can say the preprint. So you can archive your preprint and your postprint. 
but you cannot archive the publisher's PDF. That's their standard rules. Um, so if you wanted to change that, you would have to probably negotiate hard. Um, <laughs> you'd have to be ready to go in there and know, know what you're going in with. Um, so you can check different journals on that and see what you need. Um, another service they have is Sherpa Juliet, and it, that's in the lower right down here. And what that'll do is that shows funders open access policies. So if you're getting grant money from institutions and they say you need to put your data sets out publicly, so you need to use something such as MoSpace or Figshare to put those data sets out there, um, you can check that with the Sherpa Juliet. Um, any questions on that? Quick search. Um, there's, you can get down more detailed on these. So give yourself some time to play with that. And I think we're coming to them. Yeah, yeah. it's it's two o'clock, so if anybody has to leave, they're welcome to leave. I was, we were just gonna do one last thing, and that's talking about journal impact factors. So if anybody wants to do about journal impact factors, they can stay. And if anybody else needs to leave, I understand it, it is, Two o'clock. How many people have heard or are familiar with journal impact factors? Some of you, few of you. Um, journal impact factors, it's a numerical metric that indicates a, rank, a journal ranking. It indicates the importance of the journal to some people. It's, there are a lot of different ways to rank journals, and the one that people have widely accepted and still use, even though there's a lot of criticism about it, is journal impact factors. And these, this is a metric that's assigned by the company that does Web of Science, that database. And so it does the journal, it computes the impact factors, the numerical value for journals that are covered in what's called Web of Science, their core collection, they, which is, oh, I forget, it's about, I think about 12,000 journals. Um, there are journals in the sciences and the social sciences. So far, they have not assigned impact factors to any journals in the humanities. Um, and what else should I say about it? Um, we're gonna look at it real quick. Um, you can, a lot of times the publisher will indicate, let's, let's just go to a website, or a, let's look up a journal. Um, a lot of publisher websites will, um, this is an education journal. Well, often, I should have checked this before. Here they do. They have journal metrics. So just like people, they're now having metrics. And if the journal has an impact factor, chances are the publisher is going to list it on the web page for the journal because it is considered a status or a symbol of quality. So publishers are always trying to get their journals to have impact factors. But the Web of Science has certain criteria that the journals have to meet before they can have impact factors. And the impact factor is basically the average number of times an article that's published in the journal has been cited. Um, basically, that's what it is. So in this case, this has an impact factor of 3.983, so almost four. So that means on the average, an article that's been published in the journal in the last year or so has been cited on the average four times. And then there's a five year, um, and that's based on two years of data. There's a five year. Um, so, and, there, and the impact factors are always a year behind. So this is for 2016. Well, this one, the 3.983 is for 2016. Um, well, actually it is 2000, I'm sorry. They put out the 2007, I'm a year behind. Um, well, actually, it is confusing. I think they call it, well, no, it is 2016. I'm getting you all confused. They don't come out till, I mean, they just came out in August. So it takes them, to me, it takes them a long time to compute these impact factors when it seems like it should be, they should have them out in early spring. But they don't have them out till late summer. 
and that's why I get all confused. So right now, the most current impact factor for this journal is 2016, and the next one won't come out till August of 2018, and that'll be the 2017. Now, the impact factor by itself really doesn't mean anything, because it's kind of like the H index. Um, you go, well, is 4.6 good? Well, in the, like, the field of molecular biology, where there's all sorts of researchers and they're publishing all sorts of articles, no, that will not be a good one. In education, that's probably pretty good. But, but the way we can see that is we can go to, we've got um, a resource. I don't know if I still have our guide up there. Um, we have a resource. I'll just look at it here. It's on, it's on our guide. Oh, no, that's my journal. Oh. Called Journal Citation Reports. And if you look a journal up in here, you can either look up a title of a journal in here, or you can look at a subject area, whichever you want to do. Um, and you can see journals ranked by subject area. But we're going to first look at the journal. So we'll type it in the upper left-hand corner here. What was it? Learning and instruction. And if it's, if it's covered by this, um, if it has an impact factor, it'll pop up down below the search box and you click on that and then all the data shows up and in this case you can see here we go this has an impact factor as we already know from the journal side of 2016 and it has impact factors through the years and you can see it's actually gone up quite a bit in 2002 it was less than one and then there's a five-year impact factor but what you really want to look at to see if this is a good impact factor or not, how high it is, is you want to look at rank. So click on rank. And here you can see it's in the, it's ranked number four out of 235 journals that are listed in the category education and educational research. So that would be very, very good. And it's also in another category. And it's also in educational psychology, and it's interesting, it's number four in both. That usually doesn't yeah. <laughs> happen. Um, usually there's one category it's better in, than in others. And some journals only have one category. Some may have two, a few have three. Um, so if you wanted to see other journals in this category, say you want to you publish an article and you just want to see what, what are some good journals to publish in, I think if you just click on this, it'll take you. But if not, it's going to take you. Thinking about it, but if it doesn't, you can come up here. It lists the categories up here at the top, and if you click on a category, it'll list them right here, and you can rank them how you like. You can sort them in how you like, I should say, not rank them. So right now, the top journal in this field is Educational Psychologist, and it's got an impact factor of a little over six. So really, you know, any journal that's got an impact factor would be a good one to publish in. But of course, for promotion and tenure purposes, the higher up you can get in the ranking, the better. Now there is criticism about impact factors, how some publishers or journal editors have tried to manipulate um, how often their articles are cited to get higher impact factors. And some of them have been publicly called out and shamed. Um, because they were requiring authors to cite their other journals that they're that they publish or to cite cite a certain number of times and so there is controversy but so far no other journal ranking has come out that people have really accepted so the only journal ranking you'll probably hear about in academics is the journal citation or journal impact factors or what they're called and just like we said before, like in feel like education, let's go, let's select another category. The highest in education is six. Let's do, now let's do, um, okay, biochemistry and molecular biology. We'll look at that. Ranking.
It's not, it's not flipping over. Whoops. Oh. I don't know why it's stuck on that journal. Let's go. We'll do it this way. <laughs> we'll backtrack. Oops. Okay, now we'll go into oh, I kept that. I don't I don't know why it's why it won't go. Oh well let's do clear. Let's do this. We'll clear it and then come back. Try that. Okay, finally. The top one in molecular biology is cell, and it's got an impact factor of over 30. So it looks like you have to go down pretty far to get to, you have to go down to number 37 to get into the low sixes. So just like H indexes, it's all relative to what field you're in, how much people are citing each other, how many researchers are in the field. Um, it's the same in the sciences and the social sciences too will be the same. Yeah, so that's one point if you're ever citing the, or ever quote, putting in these impact factors, you wanna put in which um, category it is. And the ranking category, yeah. or at least whether it's um, you know, top quartile, bottom quartile. You need to give it some context, in other words. And if somebody comes at you and says, well, this has a, you know, impact factor of such and such, well, okay, well, what's the category and what quartile is it in? What does that mean? And, and not all journals, as I said earlier, not all journals have impact factors. Certainly ones that are newer are not going to have impact factors. They have to be been published, have a publishing record before they'll even be considered to have an impact factor. And, and they add journals all the time and occasionally they drop journals. If the journal is not meeting their standards, they, they'll drop a journal from having an impact factor. Well, thanks for sticking around. Um, any other questions? If not now, later, you can always.